Hello, I'm Daniel, and um, I'm going to talk about um, reverse engineering and then replacing software that's pr proprietary. Um, and there's pretty much anything um, as far as Linux um, for the first almost first 10 years, someone had to do that. So we, you, you think that it's impossible, but you know it was done. And um, so there's a few reasons. So if, if you're working on a black box, you really don't know what you're going to find because you haven't looked into it yet. And uh, when you, with a, a, a black box, OK, so a black box is in any kind of technology where you don't know how it works. So there's no schematics. There's, um, there may be bugs in it, and you can't fix them, unlike open source. Um, you might not be able to leave if, say, they, they ha the software has features that you can't port out, um, or you can't, sometimes you can't even extract your data from it. And you, there might be software or, or hardware features that you don't know what they're even doing that might be not in your best interest. Um, so how do you get started with reverse engineering? And you know, a lot of people think that you, you need to be an elite hacker, but you know, everyone has to start somewhere. And how do you do it? Um, so I'm going to start with an example of a piece of software called BitKeeper. And BitKeeper existed was the, the way the Linux kernel was managed for about three years before uh, Git was written. And it is. Um, so it's a version control system. And not only was it a proprietary software, but it had a lot of restrictions on the li license. And in the, the free version, you couldn't look at any version other than the most recent version. And if you, you think about like version control, so much of it is about like looking at how things have changed. And if you were not, you weren't paying for the, the full expensive version, you couldn't even look at what the la previous version was. Um, and they wouldn't uh, give a license for the full version to anyone who worked for the open source development labs. And that included Lias Torvalds himself. So Lias Torvalds, the primary maintainer of the Linux kernel, couldn't look at even like one, one revision back on his own with the software that he chose to use for it. Uh, so another developer decided that this was a bad idea. And there's, there's actually like a lot of people who thought it was a bad idea. And there's frequent flame wars about it. And um, so one, one of them, uh, Andrew Tridge, was uh, famous for reverse engineering Windows networking. So if you're using Windows, connecting to a Windows network on, from Linux, or for Mac OS, you're using software that he started. And so he was seen as someone who is an amazingly good reverse engineer guy. Um, he started working on, thought it was a bad idea. He looked into it. And people freaked out because they were dependent on this piece of software to develop the Linux kernel. And it didn't have any way that they knew of to export the data into any other thing. It was designed to replace what you were using, but they didn't want anyone to, it had vendor lock-in. It was designed so that you couldn't leave it. Um, and so he got a lot, a lot of, um, you know, kind of flame stuff about that. And he decided to settle things in a keynote presentation at a big conference. And the way he, he showed that he wasn't doing some crazy illegal thing as far as reverse engineering it was he asked the audience what he thought, what they thought he should do in order to reverse engineer it. And the audience actually told him everything he needed to know to, to reverse engineer it. So he was like, okay, see, I didn't, it wasn't like a special skill of myself, but anyone, anyone, you know, this, 
the audience could reverse engineer this for us during the course of a single talk. Um, so, uh, so he reverse engineered it with a mob. So the first thing was like, okay, let's connect to the server. And he connected with it with Telnet. And I was like, oh, I connected. And I was like, okay, well, let's, let's see what happens when I type something in. And I was like, help. And this is what he got back from the BitKeeper server. I was like, um, and he was like, oh, look, there's a clone command. What happens if I run that? And it just like dumped out like all of the data of all the history of Linux kernel and BitKeeper. I was like, oh, thank you. Reverse engineering done. And so this was something that was that was like fully proprietary for three years, and they're like, there's no way to get out of this. And you know, in five minutes, okay, we fi we figure this out. Um, most re reverse engineering tasks are a little bit harder than that, but you know, like sometimes it's easy, and it's one of the things a, a, a black box is it's it's uh, it might be incredibly difficult, or it might be really easy, and you really don't know until you start poking at it. So I mean, like for for an example of something that's really difficult would be something like. Um, uh, something they they use to prevent you from copying music or movies because they intentionally designed that to make it difficult. But in, if they didn't, if the engineers their goal was not to make it difficult for you, their goal was to write software. Their goal was to make something that works. They're going to make it in a way that's easy for them to write something that works, which is probably not going to be in the most complicated way possible. It's going to be the way that's the most straightforward. Um, so a lot of re reverse engineering is, is just like, OK, what, what, what was the person trying to accomplish when they wrote this? Um, there may be secrets about it, but they, unless they're in working for a, a company or on a project where they're intentionally trying to make it secret, it's probably not going to be super obfuscated. It'll just be, you know, obfuscated because you compiled it, or, you know, something like that that, that changed it away from what the original code was. Uh, okay, I'm not going to go into that example. Um, so, so, what are some of the tools that you can use uh, if you're you're working with hardware? Just like getting out a screwdriver, take it apart. Um, if you if you look at part numbers inside of the hardware, often those have a data sheet that you can look up, and it'll tell you. All kinds of documentation. Sometimes you can't get data sheets for stuff. Sometimes it's like a slightly customized part, um, in which case you might find a part that's similar that is documented. And most, uh, you know, because they're not going out of their way to change things, often the the um, documentation for the similar part will apply mostly to the part that you do have. Um, uh, there's there's various tools for poking at hardware such as uh, JTAG. Um, there's a device called Bus Pirate, which is an open source solution for looking at various uh, data going over hardware. And uh, the uh, GNU debugger is a great tool. You can look at a lot of stuff. Um, for networks, there's uh, Wireshark. Um, is a great tool. It'll just look, rip apart every single data packet that's in any kind of known format. Nmap will find everything on the network. Uh, you can you can get around some kinds of encryption by setting up your own proxy and setting it to trusted. And then there's a grand tool called Netcat, which is a Swiss Army knife for various network stuff. Uh, software there's debuggers. Um, you know, for example, sometimes, uh, you know, like if, if there's an API that's somewhat proprietary, you can run it in a debugger and set a breakpoint, and it'll just go straight into <coughs> the proprietary code and like rip it apart for you. Um, uh, Strings is a program that just looks through programs and looks for you know like C strings, and you can find out a lot of information from that often because uh, is like anytime someone has like a little print statement of like if this print this thing to the log, 
you can just get a whole list of all that stuff because usually they'll they'll be like one after another in one one part of the code. Um, exported symbols. Sometimes uh, programs um, they stripped out from the include file how to access different bits of code, but they'll still export symbols. So you just add that stuff back in, make a header that adds that stuff back in, and then you can use those functions. Um, log files are really useful, and object dump is the uh, um, open source uh, tool for turning a, um, machine code back into assembly. Uh, so um, a, a case study on um, something is reverse engineered is uh, 3D cameras. And the, the first one that uh, consumer 3D camera that came out uh, about four and a half years ago was the uh, Kinect for the Xbox 360. And the, before the Kinect was available for sale, there's a bounty put out for whoever could make a free software driver to use it. The, someone got, got a um, USB logging device so that it's uh, like, it's like getting, uh, USB is a lot like a net network. It has little packets that go back and forth. And so you can get hardware devices that you just stick in line with the USB and get all the data communication going back and forth. And uh, so someone got a log of that between the Xbox 360 and a Kinect and published that online. And there's a prize of, I think it was $3,000 for the first person to write software that could inter interface with the camera. Um, uh, there, someone, someone like got a camera and said that they got it working, but they didn't publish code, and they tried to extort more money for like opening, open sourcing it. And well, that was going on. Someone else, like uh, in Europe, they they launched like a few days later than they did in America. And so someone was like had been looking through those logs and figuring stuff out, and like the, you know. He like waited in line to get a camera as soon as it was available, and he had already like mostly figured it out at that point. And so, uh, a few hours after he got a camera, he posted it online and cl claimed the prize. Um, the some month the the Connect, although it was a Microsoft product, was actually based on technology developed by a Israeli company called PrimeSense. Uh, Microsoft did develop some stuff on top of it, largely in the software realm, but the, uh, uh, a lot of the core technology was by this other company. And they released their own open source driver sometime after this first um, open source driver came out. It was, it was later revealed that the, the money was not for the bounty was actually put up by someone who worked for Microsoft who tried to get Microsoft to open up the camera for use because like not only was the, the Kinect um, you know like Windows only, it was like Xbox only. Not only was it Xbox only, it was um, just having a license to develop Xbox applications wasn't enough. You had to be part of a one of the special soft video game developers that was specially licensed to develop stuff for Kinect. And so it was like really closed, even though it was like this really great new technology. And so when Microsoft was like, no, 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 we've put so much effort into this. This is such an awesome thing. We want everyone to do stuff with this. There's so many applications for it. And he put down his own money secretly. And from people who are looking at doing the competition, it seemed to be coming from Adafruit Corporation, but it wasn't their own money. It was someone else's. They were just being a proxy to hide the secret of where the money was coming from. Um, so I've been working with uh, a new 3D camera, which Intel is going to have for sale in like Best Buy in a month or something. And they're going to have Android support at some point. Um, Right now, their API is Windows 8.1 only. There's actually three different products that they're 
putting the RealSense trademark on, which are different technologies, which is probably confusing for people where they think, oh, this is a RealSense camera. And it's like, well, what kind of RealSense camera? Um, so I got one of these at a, at a hackathon. It's just like anyone who showed up at 8 a.m. on in late December on a Thursday got one. Um, well, they, they only like publicly announced it like two days before it happened. Um, so, and they didn't make me sign anything that said I wouldn't reverse engineer it. So, um, I, you know, like initially I was like, okay, this is really fun to play with at the hackathon because they, they provided us all with uh, loaner Windows laptops that had all the software development tools set up. And I was like, ah, oh, this is really cool and awesome and I want to play with it. But I, I use Linux and, you know, I un uninstalled Windows a few months ago because it was taking up space and I never rebooted into it. So I was like, ah, what can I do? Um, so I, I, I like let it sit down for like a week and then it was, Christmas Eve, and there's nothing going on, and I was bored, and I was like, let's plug it into Linux, see what I can do. I, I don't know. You know, it's a, it's a black box. You never know until you try how difficult it's going to be. So I was like, well, I'll try. I'll do, I'll do something. And so there, I was, I was lucky in various ways. Um, one of them is that Intel is into standards compliance, and so they, they helped came up, come up with the USB standard, and they're not going to violate the USB standards in their own products. So um, even though it's like this new proprietary thing, they complied with the USB video standard as much as was possible because the USB standard has uh, pixel formats for color video. But they don't have a pixel format for every pixel is a distance. Um, and so they had to you know, add a few things to it. Um, but it was close enough that when I plugged it in, Linux was like, oh, that's a USB camera. And it did something. Um, and it showed up as like, oh, I attached a USB video camera to your computer. But most applications would not display video from it. Um, I had to poke around and try like everything that would connect to USB video before I found something and it was like, and it displayed this green video with like weird bands on it. I was like, okay, well, it's close. It was like, I got some video, but it's wrong. And um, so I started working with uh, this um, uh, tool set for multimedia on, an open source stuff um, called GStreamer, and you can you can put stuff together on the command line, and I, I like bugged people on IRC, and I was like, what what can I do? And I, I tried like compiling stuff in C, and that wasn't working. And then finally, I figured out that I could with just a command line, I could say is like, okay, pretend. I know the video says it's this, but pretend it's this other thing, and then voila, I had black and white depth data to my screen. I was like, yes! And that was about um, two weeks after I started poking with it. And, or, or, I don't know, it was at least a week, and I started writing a blog post about it. And that was the first week of January, which is at the same time as the um, computer entertainment um, uh, I can't remember what the acronym is, but as a consumer, oh, Consumer Electronics Show. And Intel was heavily promoting their new amazing camera. And so I got the blog post done near the end of the week, and I posted, and I was like, oh, yeah, that, that thing that you've been reading about all week. Uh, I, got, I plugged it into Linux. I got some video out of it. It hit the, the front page of Hacker News in like two hours. And... Um, and I, and I also included a little thing. I was like, if you think what I'm doing is cool, like, send me some money. And, you know, like, an hour later, my friend sent me five bucks. And I was like, ah, that's cool. Whatever. <laughs> um, but then, like, the next day, there's like, someone sent me a hundred bucks. And I was like, some random stranger sent me a hundred bucks. 
and like they didn't even like demand anything from me. They're just like, ah, that's cool. Here's a hundred bucks. And then like more money came in. And I was like, okay, okay. I guess I have to write, do some more work to pay off these people <laughs> that gave me money. So I started working on it more and uh, uh, put out some software. But so you know th that was just like the first thing is like get some video out of it. But there's a lot more to do because the you know like the with it's essentially like a sensor and like with sensors you know if you if you think of like a, a scale they have like a zero scale and so it's trying to find depth and most applications you want to know like you don't want to know like oh i have an integer it, you want i want that in like meters or millimeters or something and it has two different cameras it has a depth camera and it has a color camera and you need to to merge them together so that you have a color for that point in space rather than you have a color image and you have a point in space. Um, so there's a, a lot of work that's had to be done with it since then and it's still not um, super useful for a lot of applications. Um, so I got, uh, let's see if I can get Oh, the software. Uh, I may have to close this window. I wrote some software in Qt, or if you, which a lot of people don't know that the Qt framework is pronounced Qt. It has a pronunciation. As using Linux for. 15 years before I knew that. Um, yeah, as I, I end up like calling it QT anyways because uh, people don't know what I'm talking about. Um, let's see. Um, yeah, the color camera is 1080p. That's not going to fit over there. Um, let's see. How about this one? I got. I got some controls for it. Um, so it has some, it has like the normal like color controls on it. But I found this is one of the first things that I figured out was um, it has some weird controls like laser power. Um, <laughs> most cameras don't have that setting. Um, well, okay, so the, the thing is, is that, so it, it works by, it has a, a video projector, which uses, it's a laser video projector, so it's extra cool. Um, and it's an infrared, so you can't see the stuff that it projects with the human eye. And that it works by, it has a, a laser projector and it has an infrared camera. And it can figure out the distance because it knows it, it projects like a dot or some kind of feature that it can find with the projector and it knows what the position x y of that is and on the infrared camera it knows where it sees that dot in x y and from the and then it knows the distance between the projector and the camera and so then you have angle side angle and from that you can calculate a distance and that's, that's basically how it works. And the, the, the reason why you want to be able to turn the laser power down is if you have something really close to the camera, it's, it's like um, if you have a really bright light and you have like you know, the aperture on your camera way open, it's just everything's going to be white. So you be, it has an option to set turn the laser power down so that you can get something really close to the camera and still get a 3D image from it. And that's actually one of the most important features of this camera because most of the people who want to use it as far as things like robotics, what, what makes this camera really um, compelling is that they can get close to things and get a 3D image. If you look at like the Xbox Connect, um, you have to be you know, a few feet away before it can get reasonable 3D data. And this camera 
If you turn the laser power way down, you can get you know, some 3D data at three centimeters. Um, at that point, the, projector has, the projector's beam spread hasn't gotten all that far out, so you only have like half of the frame is illuminated. But you got like half a frame of 3D data at three centimeters, which is tremendously closer than any of the other consumer cameras you can get out there. Um, another is it, it's got a really high refresh rate and really high resolution. Is it, um, like it's got the 1080p color camera, which is better than any of the other cameras out there. The, the depth data is 640 by 480, which is, it seems like a low resolution, but for um, depth, it's the best out there. And um, part of how it does that is that uh, with, um, a, a, as you can imagine with, if you have a dot and you're looking for the dot in the camera, um, okay, that gives you one 3D point. But you want to get like a full 3D model of things, you need many points. And so it has multiple features that it's projecting out. If the, those are too close to each other, you can't find them separately in the camera. Um, because like the, if the dots are touching, where's one dot end and the next dot begin? Um, the, this camera like gets around that by projecting multiple patterns. So it has like, um, it's from what I've seen of it, it, it seems to be doing kind of like a, a binary division of space where it's like, okay, like half of, half of the image has got light and half of it doesn't. And so from the, the, the camera side, it's like, okay, anything that's illuminated is on this side and anything that's not illuminated is on that side. And then it like breaks that into four. I was like, okay, now I know like more precisely what I'm looking at, and and it just like breaks stuff down until it's got like the full spread of of to get a really dense um, 3D image, and but it puts out 60 frames a second. So in order to do that whole um, getting the whole um, frame of 3D data 60 times a second, it has to run at like 550 frames a second to get you know like the 11 or 9 to 11 frames of different patterns to get narrowed down to um, each individual spot. Um, that seems like a really extreme thing if, if you look at like uh, you know like the video on your uh, computer monitor you know like 120 frames a second is pretty high but it it seems uh, I haven't. I don't know for sure, but I'm pretty sure that the projector is um, a micro mirror display. So, um, and th those work by they they have like a little mirror, uh, a, a mirror for every pixel that can turn towards the light or not towards the light. And in order to get grayscale, they have to do it multiple times per frame. So it's just like okay, some of the time you have light, some of the time you don't, and so. But if you're not trying to do grayscale, you're just doing light or not light, then you know all those little like multiple switches of the the mirror per frame you can use as like actual images because it's just a light or no light. It's not a grayscale, so it's just like okay. And then your um, the infrared camera that's not too extreme. If you look at like the new new iPhone, it does like. 300 frames a second or something like that. So it's a, it's a little bit better, but it's not ridiculously out there with what technology is available now. Um, let's see. Probably since the depth image is only 640 by 480, that'll fit. Um, let's see. Do I have the thing? Where's the thing to turn it on? There it is. <coughs> Where's my mouse pointer? Where is this my mouse pointer? I can't find my mouse pointer. That makes it harder.
Well, Alt tabbed in order to get it on top. Ah, there it was. Okay, maybe. Yay. Um, so it's since it's like um, the integer is a distance, it's like the the farther away it gets brighter because I just oh just take that number and stick it in there. Um, so it's not really exciting in this point, but it's like you you can can translate those into uh, distances. Um, though I haven't fully figured out the the calibration part of that. Um, I did figure out that um, the, oh, well, actually, someone else figured out. So there's, once I, once I got the blog post out, people would email me. And the, the most helpful people have been uh, from a company called Dorabot in Shenzhen, China. And they're like, hey, we figured this thing out. Or um, do you have any insight on this thing about it? So. That's one of the great things about open source is you end up with colla collaborators as soon as you, you do anything um, if, if it's something that someone else is interested in. You know, that actually, you know, if you think about it, most open source projects have one contributor. But uh, if, if you, in this case, it's like, OK, I'm, I'm the only one who has anything for working with this camera. So I got people talking to me immediately. At least you know the few hundred that could get a camera, which isn't a lot. Um, but uh, so, for example, with the, these controls down here, um, I found them because they sent me some information that they found. It was like, okay, well, we found like that they wrote something for the Windows API, and I was like, okay, here's all the numbers that we got out of it, and I said, oh. Those are interesting. And I look through the numbers that I got from the USB dump. I was like, oh, those exactly match up with these things. And so, so it was like, for exact example, this one, the laser power, it was like, it goes from 0 to 16. And so they sent me something where I was like, well, there's laser, and it goes from 0 to 16 with a default value of 16. And I found in the USB dump, I was like, oh, there's that thing that goes from 0 to 16 with the default value of 16. I bet that's the laser. <laughs> laser power. So I made, I made a thing to control that, and it, and it changed the picture. And I was like, yes, I win. <laughs> um, and so that's an example of where if it wasn't for on my own, I hadn't figured it out. But then when someone else sent me some, some information, what they'd figured out, I was like, oh. Immediately, okay. This is how it works. Um, another example of that is with the uh, the depth. Um, so they 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 immediately hooked up their camera to a robot. Um, They hooked up their camera to a robot, and they're trying to do actually useful things with it immediately. And I was like, I'm still figuring out how to calibrate this thing. And they're like, we're, we're building a robot. Um, and they figured out that the, the numbers as far as the depth, because they figured out a thing for converting the, the raw numbers into actual you know, millimeters. So it was like, the numbers change over time, and we think that it seems to be that like the longer that's on, it, it changes, and so we think it's temperature based, and that as the temperature increases, it changes things. And I was like, oh, well, that would make sense because the the projector and the camera are probably mounted together on a piece of metal, and they the the projector certainly generates heat, and as it generates heat, the metal expands. They get farther apart. That's the side of the one side of the triangle, um, and it was like you know, like, it was like okay, you think of like about metal expanding from heat, and it's like oh, it's it's imperceptible. But if you think about it, it's like how small is a pixel on an imaging sensor? It's like oh, that it, it actually expands by more than a pixel, um, or it was like even like half a pixel is is, is something. So I was like ah, oh, okay. Let's look in the data for something that looks like temperature. And there's 
most of the stuff that the, the camera does is, is using the USB video standard, but you know, there, there's things where it was like an obvious ex extension, like just having another uh, image format for depth. And it's a really simple image format where it's like, oh, the pixel is an integer. Ooh, complicated. But there's, they, they have a second interface that's, that's been kind of like mystery data. Like I could see that there was some stuff where I was like, okay, like every, every outgoing command from the computer has like the same four bytes on it. It's like, oh, okay. So it needs that and then like this other byte seems to control like how big a response is. I don't know what that data is, but you know, it might be a few bytes or it might be 800 bytes depending on like what the thing is, but is is like consistent as far as like how big the data was. I, was. I didn't know what it was. And so I said I was like, "Oh, so I mean, I'm sure that the developers of this camera, if it's temperature dependent, had a way to measure the temperature on the camera so they could calibrate it." It, it seems kind of surprising to me that they didn't just do it on the camera and just give you the calibrated data already, but uh, maybe that was harder. So I, I started looking and it's like, oh, well, there's this one thing where there's like literally only one byte that changes. Um, and I was like, and the number is pretty close. Uh, if you just say that number is in degrees C, that sounds like about the temperature the camera would be. And so because he told me, uh, you know, uh, actually, I'm not sure who told me because they they tended to like be cc'd with multiple people, so I didn't always know who I was talking to. Um, and I was like, oh, there's a temperature, and I like looked at that. And I made a little tool that like poked with those the same, just like raw wrote the packet that I saw in the USB logs out, and I got a number back, and I made a little thing that would like update in the terminal when the number changed. And I was like, oh yeah. It goes up, I turn on the camera, it starts going up. I turn it off, it starts going down. Sounds like a temperature to me. Um, so collaboration is like really useful. Um, there's a robotics conference, an IEEE robotics conference in May in Seattle. It's an international conference. Next year it's in Stockholm. I was just lucky that it's only 200 miles away this year. So I got on a bus for like 50 bucks round trip, stayed with some friends, and met these guys from Shenzhen. And as I, I learned some things like, oh, I was primarily working with one guy, but his English is not as good as the other guy. So when they emailed, they tended to email together, but I was really working with the one guy. So the other guy was more with like the mechanical stuff, but he had better English. So, um, and it was really great to meet him. And it was like, oh, yay, open source. Um, and, and they released their, their own thing, but is um, their own tool, but it's a, 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 a module for the robot operating system, which is an open source robotics toolkit where you can be plug in sensors and motors and has things for visualizing what a robot's doing, yeah, it's pretty sweet. Um, so there's, there's multiple open source projects around this. Um, I, I'm the only one who's gotten uh, a kernel patch together, and I, I've been doing more of like the low level stuff, and they've been doing actual practical applications for it. Um, and someone else got a user space uh, driver patch to get the pixel formats out. So there's there's actually two different drivers that'll work with this camera now that are both open source. There's a patch kernel driver, and then there's a user space lib USB driver, which um, I'm told kind of works with Mac OS. Um, kind of. It's not very good. Um, but that's about the state of things right now. Um, I'm trying to work on, um, as I was developing it, I was like, OK, eventually people are going to want to use this as a library, not as an application that just gives them a boring grayscale image of depth. They're going to want to be able to plug it into their own application. They're going to want to 
get an actual like 3D model out of that rather than pixels as distances. But I decided that it was like, OK, I'm reverse engineering this. I don't even know what the interface to the camera is yet. So trying to make a, a sane API when I don't even know what the thing is, is I, I, I just was like, OK, that, that's, that's just going to be too complicated. So I just made something that could do it, and I just like hack at it when I figure something new out. It's uh, most of the core stuff I'm pretty confident on now. So I'm like, OK, now it's time to make a library. So I'm, I'm like copying and pasting chunks of code out of my application into a, a library, but that's not ready yet. What, um, when, you when you release like, an API, people tend to complain if you change it dramatically and break everything. So I'm like, OK, I want to get it kind of good before I put it out there. And right now, it can, it can display video, but then when you shut it down, it crashes in a way where you have to unplug the camera and plug it in again before it'll work again, which is OK with this camera. But the, you know, like later this summer, uh, this camera is going to be as like a webcam for your laptop. And you can't unplug and plug that in very well. So people would probably get really annoyed. It's like, oh, I have to reboot my computer before I can use this application again? That's not great. Uh, so I was like, OK, I should, I, pr I should probably get the library to the point of where you can shut down the camera. So just start it so that you can use it again when you're done. Um, any questions? Mm -hmm.